All right, gentlemen, let's go ahead and finish off chapter 10 by looking at presidential transition. What does that mean? Uh, that refers to, obviously, the movement from one presidency to the next, for whatever reason that might be. How does that work, and what's the flow and, and the plan? At one point, there actually was no plan. Now there is one. No president, but except for Mr. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, has ever served more than two terms. And thanks to the 22nd Amendment of the United States Constitution, ratified in 1951, there will never again be a more than two-term president. Um, they would have to change the Constitution to open that back up. It now stands at 10 years is the maximum time you could spend as president, because the way the 22nd Amendment is written, if you serve two years or less, of another person's term, it doesn't count against your total. So let's say you're the vice president, and like what happened with JFK, you're in, in the third year of, of the term, and the president dies, and you fill in for that final year. That last year doesn't count against you. You could still run for president twice, um, up to two years. Now, if in the first seven months someone ends up killing the president and you take over, the three years and five months that you spent count as your first term as president. So the 22nd Amendment has put a clear limit on how many times or how many years you can serve as president. Um, but honestly, we only had one guy do it out of, you know, 30 some odd people um, prior to this amendment was passed. Tradition, more than the Constitution, um, is what kind of, of served as the line for the two terms, right? George Washington did two and walked away. The thought that anybody should be there longer than George Washington seemed a little ridiculous. And honestly, tradition and the Constitution aren't the really limiting factors. Like a lot of things with FDR, he's not your typical example. Like you can't look at FDR and be like, yeah, yeah, we clearly needed that to prevent that from the future. Um, his circumstances and situation were so unique and special. I don't think anyone could get a third term, to be quite honest, at this point. Only about a third of presidents since George Washington have even been elected to a second term, right? So only one-third of the presidents have actually been two-term presidents. Of the 27 not re-elected to a second term, four of them died in office during their first term. The remainder either did not seek or more often did not secure re-election. Um, of the 27 who were one-term presidents, let's see, four of them died in office. Um, I know that James K. Polk did not seek re-election. So what, now we're down to 22 failed to win re-election. Um, I think Rutherford B. Hayes, it was understood that he would not seek re-election. So now you're down to 21. My point being, a lot of people have tried and failed to win re-election um, without the Constitution limiting them. Of the eight presidents who died in office, four were assassinated. Presidents uh, Lincoln, Garfield, McKinley, and Kennedy. Um, at least six other presidents were targets of unsuccessful assassination attempts. Jackson, Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, Truman, Ford, and Ronald Reagan. There may have been other attempts that we never knew about or never actually were carried to the point of actually making the attempt. Um, by the way, this is a moment where I like to point out um, the 20-year curse that actually um, George W. Bush finally broke. So if you go back to 1840, William Henry Harrison dies in office a month in the presidency, right? 1860, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. 1880, Garfield is assassinated. 1900, McKinley is assassinated. 1920, um, I, I'm just I'm naming the year that they were elected, right? 1920, Warren G. Harding died of a stroke in uh, or of a heart attack, excuse me, in 1923. 1940, Franklin Delano Roosevelt will die in office in 1945. 1960, JFK assassinated in 1963. Um, in 1980, Ronald Reagan, there was an assassination attempt on him early in his presidency, and he was shot. George W. Bush, elected in 2000, is the first president elected in those 20-year increments 
to not have a to either die in office or to have an assassination attempt against them um, in office that I'm aware of. You know, actually, if you think about it, you have to go all the way to Ronald Reagan before you get one of these guys who didn't die in office. All the other ones died in office. Um, and then George W. Bush finally no assassination attempt and did not die in office. But anyhow, I'm sorry. I'd like to point out that fun little fact. Now, um, <clears throat> anyhow, moving forward, the presidents who serve two or more terms generally are one of two groups. You've got those founding presidents, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. And then you've got the wartime presidents. you got Lincoln, Wilson, Roosevelt. Um, and then there's a third category we tend to point towards. The tranquil times. Monroe, McKinley, Eisenhower, Clinton. Um, and that's not to say that there can't be a combination of those factors. But generally speaking, the men who were elected to multiple terms as president were either founding father presidents, wartime presidents, or presidents who actually were presidents during a time of relative peace and prosperity and growth in this country's history. Excuse me. Um, when the country was deeply divided, like in the pre-Civil War period, one hit wonders. Uh, and during the highly divided Reconstruction era, again, one hit wonders generally, with the exception of Ulysses Grant, who was a wartime hero. Um, outside of that, your odds of getting reelected are actually not good. Um, if you really start to think about it, you have to have certain factors line up in your favor. And that goes back to something I said in the last video, just to rewind for a moment. You can't control what's going on. Um, just to just to hearken to our own present day. My my I have no predictions for 2020 anymore. I, I had. I had some, some generic statements about the 2020 election. I even made them in class with you all where I talked about as long as the economy stayed solid, Donald Trump was going to get reelected. That was my take on it, right? And I, I kind of put my little asterisk, barring some unforeseen calamity. Well, our unforeseen calamity has hit, kids. Um, and the economy is not going to be in good shape when this election rolls around. And you can't exactly blame Donald Trump for that. I mean, you, you, I guess you can. He is like ordering people shut stuff down, but he has to or people die. I don't know what's going to happen with this one. It doesn't bode well for him if you look at history. Um, but anyhow, you know, getting reelected is fairly rare. Um, <clears throat> now. Oh, and by the way, the uh, the presidents who died in office, I'll go ahead and, and mention, um, of the eight presidents who died in office, just in case you're wondering, I said four of them were assassinated. So you've got Lincoln, Garfield, McKinley, and Kennedy all assassinated. The other ones who died in office were William Henry Harrison, who died of pneumonia, uh, Warren G. Harding, who died, like I said, of a heart attack, um, Zachary Taylor in 1848. Um, I don't know what he died of. Well, he died in, it was 1850. Uh, I don't know what he died of. He just, he died. Um, and who am I? Oh, an FDR. So there you go. Um, yeah, that, that 20 year curse really takes care of, you know, like all the presidents who died in office, basically. Um, anyhow, because we've had eight presidents die in office, either through health, natural causes, or assassination. Eight times a vice president has become the president because of that. It first happened to John Tyler, who became president in 1841 when William Henry Harrison died a month into his term. Um, you know, old Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Well, now it was time for that Tyler two part. The question was, was John Tyler the acting president or was he just kind of like filling in until a new one, you know, was he like, is he president in every aspect? Like, did he truly take over the presidency or is he just an interim, like a fill in kind of holding the office, maintaining the flow of government until we have a new election, right? There was real question. Um, despite the arguing and the criticism um, Tyler decided on the latter, that he was, in fact, the president. Um, and he confirmed that 
by basically um, going to Congress. And, and he basically said, he kind of put it to Congress, like, you have to make a statement, like, am I president or am I acting president? You know, do I have the full power of the presidency? Do I have every aspect of this office or am I just sitting at a desk, so to speak? And Congress said, no, nah, you're president. Um, ever since, the vice president has become the president automatically when the occupant of the White House has died or resigned, in the case of Richard Nixon. Now, if vice presidents are able to get there because of death, okay, because of, of a vacancy, I should say, um, how often do they get elected to it? Not often. Um, since the earliest period, um, <clears throat> when John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were each elected president after having just recently served as vice president, only three other times has someone gone from vice president to president, like on their own accord, through an election. Okay, so again, you got five times it has happened. John Adams did it. He was Washington's vice president. He got elected in the 1796 election. His vice president was Thomas Jefferson, who then won in the 1800 election. And then after that, you have to go all the way to 1836 when Martin Van Buren was elected, um, riding the coattails of Andrew Jackson into office. Okay. Then in 1968, Richard Nixon, um, and it's not even that's not even a straight from from president or vice president to president. 1968, Richard Nixon became president after serving as Dwight Eisenhower's vice president. But remember, there was an eight year break because he lost the 1960 election to JFK, and then he didn't even run in '64. And then the third time was 1988 when George Bush succeeded Ronald Reagan. Okay, that's it. Most vice presidents get there because of a vacancy. And, and if they do, then they, then they tend to win. But actually winning the presidency from the vice presidency is incredibly difficult. For example, Teddy Roosevelt and Calvin Coolidge and Harry Truman and Lyndon Johnson, all of them were able to win election when they ran for election on their own, you know, within their own right um, after having served upon the death of the president. But no one, um, no one should look at the vice presidency as, as the penultimate step, because it's not, historically speaking. Vice president is not the career move that you make if your goal is the White House. It's not. Um, for one thing, the vice presidency is a rather empty job, honestly. Um, I, I might have mentioned this to this class. So when I was in college, one of my roommates, who was very much into politics um, and took a lot of poli-sci classes along with me because um, I got a poli-sci minor, we, we joked about how uh, we would both be old enough to run for president in, in 2016. We would both be, by that point, 35 years old. We would be eligible. And we told our, our friends and our other roommates that, that we were going to run for president. Um, and, of course, everybody said, you're both going to run? And we were like, no, 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 we'll run as a ticket. And when everybody asked, okay, so who's going to run for president, I just immediately said, I'm, I'm going for vice. I don't want to be president. I'll be vice president. Greg can be president. And, um, and people thought I was being magnanimous you know, and gracious. Truth be told, uh, vice president is an outstanding job. Um, because it isn't a job. It's a six-figure salary with a lot of perks and a lot of long-term benefits. Um, you know, it's a great retirement package. And your only job is to be in charge of the Senate and vote when there's a tie. That's literally your only job. You need to go to Senate meetings. I can go to Senate meetings. And even if you don't go to the Senate meetings, the president pro tempore will take care of it. And if they're not there, they have a substitute. You literally don't have to do anything. All you need to do is have like a beeper, right, that the Senate has the number for. And if they're tied, they'll page you, and you can come rolling on in in your pajamas and cast the break and vote, right? I mean, that's your job as vice president. Um, John Adams described it as, and I quote, the most insignificant office that ever the invention of man contrived or his imagination conceived. Thomas Jefferson 
He said, and I quote, The second office of the government is honorable and easy. The first is but a splendid misery. Dan Webster, when he was offered the opportunity to be the vice presidential candidate in 1948, he replied with, I do not choose to be buried until I'm already dead. Um, interestingly enough, as fate would have it, if he would have done that, he actually would have taken the presidency um, because he would have been the vice president under Zach Taylor, who died. Um, you know, the vice presidency, though, is not it's not where it's at. Um, <clears throat> and so most most people don't 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 seek it out. Um now, that's not to say that people turn it down all the time. It's one of those things where when somebody offers it to you, it's it's hard to say no, right? Um, you know, for example, Lyndon Johnson gave up his leadership as the majority leader in the Senate to become Kennedy's vice president. Um, you know, Al Gore left a very nice Senate seat to become vice president, as did Richard Nixon and Hubert Humphrey and Walter Mondale and a whole host of other folks, right? Um like I said, the only official job is to preside over the Senate and vote in case of a tie. And this, again, rarely takes up any of your time. You've got a president pro tempore who will take care of running the Senate for you. Um, the vice president has really no leadership power in the Senate. As we said, it's not like the Speaker of the House where you're appointing committees and you're determining who does what and you're scheduling the bills. You're not Nancy Pelosi. You're the president of the Senate. Like you hit the gavel on the table and you're like, let's do this thing. And and Mitch and Chuck, they run the show, right? You're just there to look pretty. Um, and let's let's not forget, um, there's the very real possibility that you might be the vice president of one party and a different party has the majority. Boy, that that'd be nice and awkward, right? Um <clears throat> Now, that's not to say that vice president is totally useless. You know, there is always the chance, for example, in, in you know, 9-11, um, when President Bush was actually airborne, um, you know, Vice President Cheney was taken to a secret location and, and basically was, was ready to take over if that's what, it, what needed to occur. But let's be real, 9-11 is not a great example. It's like the only time in history that we've had to have that kind of situation. Really and truly, let's be real. Most of the time, Vice President, you are an advisor to the president, and you are also a good gopher, so to speak. Um, you know, go for this. You know, like Donald Trump needs somebody to spearhead the coronavirus task force. Pence, that's a good job for you, buddy. You know, it's that kind of thing, right? Now, and here you go. This is Ronald Reagan, right before he got shot. You can't see the guy that's going to shoot him. Um, he's actually going to be like, like this direction, right? Shooting this way. Um, <clears throat> this is Ronald Reagan, right before he got shot. Now, Ronald Reagan didn't die, but he did get shot in the chest. The bullet just missed his heart, and he had to go into surgery to get it removed. Um, and of course he's going to be under, he's, he's not going to be able to be president, so to speak. And that leaves us with a major question. We know that if the president dies, the vice president's in charge. Mr. Tyler established that back in 1840. But what if the president is seriously Ill, Ill but does not die? Okay. All right. Or what if the president is just temporarily disabled? You know, what if the having surgery? He's not even ill, but he's having surgery. He's he's unconscious. He's had anesthesia, right? It's a procedure. It's going to take several hours. The man is going to be out of commission for five hours, right? Doesn't matter what you say or do. He's out. Are we going to go five hours without a leader, right? Um, I mean, that was a real issue. It was a real concern. And then there's a question of if the vice president becomes the president, who is now the vice president? Do we have a vice president? How does that work? Now, the first issue, disability, not dead, but disabled, ill, that has actually come up twice. Um, more than twice, actually. But I'm going to give you, I think, three or four examples. Um, 
For example, James Garfield was shot in 1881. He didn't die for several months. He kind of lingered, and near the end, he was he was suffering mightily and was going through the final throes of basically um, sepsis infection. Um, he was delirious near the end. But again, for several days, uh, the man was just an incoherent mess, right? But he wasn't dead yet. Um, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson had a massive stroke in 1919, and for the last few months... Um, of his presidency was basically bedridden um, and would only speak to a very, very few select advisors and his wife. Basically, his wife was running the presidency for him. Um, Eisenhower had three fairly serious bouts of illness during his presidency. Ronald Reagan, like I said, was shot in his first term and had to be hospitalized and had to have surgery to remove the bullet. He did have to spend a little bit of time hospitalized during his second term as president. Um, so this issue of what do we do if the president is disabled or incapable of doing the, the job for whatever reason, um, but is not dead, so we can't just truly replace them, what do we do? Um, the second question that I asked, which is who takes over if the vice president is, is elevated to the presidency, has arisen on eight occasions, right? Now, in these instances... If the vice president were to die, well, let me say that, okay, president dies, vice president takes over, becomes the new president. Okay, so A dies, B goes from vice president to president. Let's say B dies. We don't have a vice president. And so where would it go? Um well, that was a question mark, and there was concern, and for many decades, there was a law. Um, for example, the Succession Act of 1886 designated that the Secretary of State was the next in line for the presidency should the vice president die, which would then be followed by the other cabinet officers in their order of seniority. Um, but that meant that a vice president who became president um, could basically pick their own successor by choosing their own secretary of state. So that means we could literally have a next in line for the presidency that was never voted on, never elected, an appointed official. Okay? So the 1886 law that said in case of the death of the president and there is no vice president, or if the president dies and the vice president is elevated and now the vice presidency is void, right, or vacant, I should say, not void, vacant, then whoever had been named Secretary of State at that time would be the next in line. So you would have a, a political appointee, not an elected official. In 1947, that law was changed to make the Speaker of the House and then the President pro tempore the next in line. Um, now, a Speaker or a President pro tempore are likely to be chosen because of their seniority. And there's a very real chance they could be from a different political party. This is where that article I made you read is sort of coming into play, right? I, I, I gave you all the article a week or so earlier than maybe I should have, but it was recent. But, you know, if we don't have an election in November, the, the, the White House is going to go to a Democrat if you follow this domino, right? If, if you go the way it's supposed to go. Um, but again, there was a real chance under the 1947 law that we're going to get some person who is a senior congressman, maybe not the best leader, but is a good legislator. Um, and again, they could be a member of a different political party. That's why in 1967 we passed the 25th Amendment. The 25th Amendment is supposed to take care of some of these loopholes, so to speak, or more like question mark, not even loopholes. The disability problem is handled because it allows the vice president to serve as, as the, quote, acting president whenever the president declares he is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, or whenever the vice president and a majority of the cabinet declare that the president is incapacitated. Now, this is where some of you might have heard some rumblings early in the Trump presidency 
you know, the whole, they're going to invoke the 25th Amendment. Um, slow down, cowboy. If the president disagrees with the opinion of his vice president and the majority of the cabinet, then Congress decides the issue. And you need a two-thirds majority to confirm that the president is unable to serve. That is why all the hysteria, all the ridiculousness that was going on with people saying they're going to invoke the 25th Amendment and they're going to declare Trump is insane and they're going to take him out of office. That was some of the most foolish rhetoric I've ever heard. That is people who have only opened the Constitution and looked at the 25th Amendment and didn't think about the greater implication of the whole two-thirds vote. Right? You're going to get two-thirds of the Senate, really. You're going to get all those Republicans to magically vote he can't do his job right. No, not happening. Um, You know, this would be a case where a Woodrow Wilson, I will say that, had the 25th Amendment been around and had people been aware of Woodrow Wilson's medical condition, I could see where they would have said, yeah, you can't do this anymore, man. You're you're bedridden. You're, You're like half paralyzed. You're unable to have meetings. You're unable to have cabinet discussions. Like, no, you can't do this. Um, but again, it requires a two-third vote of the Senate if the president argues with his vice president and cabinet. The amendment also deals with the problem by requiring a vice president who assumes the presidency to nominate a new vice president. This person takes office um, if their nomination is confirmed by a majority vote of both houses of Congress. It's like a law, right? Right. Filling a vacancy in the vice presidency basically follows the path of a law, except this time the law is proposed by the new president. Okay, um, When there is no vice president, uh, if for some reason, somehow, if there is no vice president, then the 1947 law takes over. Next in line is the speaker, then the Senate president, or you know, pro tempore, and then the 15 cabinet secretaries. Okay? And I actually went and I read the 25th Amendment very quickly um, just to make sure I I was clear on everything. It outlines the process. There are four sections, by the way. Um, The first section talks about how the president, you know, the president is replaced by the vice president. If there is no vice president, here's how the vice presidency is filled. The third section is the voluntary thing where, like, And it's happened a few times. It happened in 1985 and 2002 and in 2007 um, where presidents knew they were going to go in for a procedure. They were going to be under anesthetic. And so they actually temporarily handed over the reins to the vice and they can get it back. They just basically have to submit the very same petition that they submitted to transfer the powers. Um, And then the fourth section is that whole we have a little vote. and We decide to remove them thing. Um, So the 25th Amendment is four parts, clearly outlines all of this. The disability problem has not arisen since we passed the 25th Amendment. We have yet to have a president who is long-term truly incapable of doing the job. We have had succession problems, though. In 1973, Vice President Spiro Agnew resigned. Um, He got caught taking bribes. Um, Well, he got caught having taken bribes back when he was governor of Maryland. Um, and he had to resign. Um, <clears throat> the president Nixon nominated Gerald Ford as his vice president, and he was confirmed by both houses and sworn in. But then on August 9, 1974, President Nixon resigned, um, the only president ever to do so. Ford became president. He nominated as his vice president Nelson Rockefeller, who was confirmed after extensive hearings. It's basically like a federal judgeship. There are hearings, questions, etc., um, and he was sworn in. So that actually is kind of an interesting story if you think about it, because when that happened in December of 1974, it is the first, and as far as I can think, only time in American history when the president and vice president were both men who had not been elected to either office. Again, they had not been popularly elected. Uh, Ford had been named vice president and had seated the presidency. Um, <clears throat> now let's look at the final, the final cherry on top. Um, impeachment. There is another way that we can lose our president. Impeachment. I want to point out that 
Impeachment is not only for president and vice president. It is for all civil officers of the United States, judges, congressmen, heads of departments, you know, secretaries, um, cabinet members. They're all they're all eligible for it. Um, you can be removed. Okay, that is the stiffest penalty. You can be removed and disqualified from future office because impeachment is not a court of law. The Congress cannot send you to jail. Okay, the worst they can do is boot you out of the government. Um, but anyhow, impeachment, you know, like I said, um, in general matter, cabinet secretaries and the like are not subject to impeachment because honestly, um, the president can just remove them. Um, and and if, if they're getting caught and in, in naughty, the president's going to cut them loose, right? He's going to cut his losses. He's going to terminate them. You're not going to fight on to the bitter end, right? You know, if the secretary of of the Veterans Bureau or whatever, if the head of the of the head of the VA, if we discovered that the head of the VA was just stealing money from the VA, we're not going to keep him in charge of the VA until he's convicted by a Senate impeachment trial, we're going to, we're going to remove him as the head of the VA, you know? And so that's why in practice, honestly, while, while they're all eligible to be impeached, cabinet secretaries and bureau chiefs and heads of departments, they aren't going to be impeached because they will get terminated. Now, federal judges, on the other hand, they have actually been the objects of impeachment more than anyone else in American history because they're there for a life and they have a vested interest to fight their case. Um, an impeachment is an indictment, um, for lack of a better metaphor. To be impeached is to be indicted. Okay, A set of charges are voted on by the House of Representatives. Okay. Now, that, that just means that you're going to be brought to trial. It takes a majority vote. A majority of the House must vote articles of impeachment to have an impeachment trial. Okay, So a majority of the House has to vote that, yes, you should be tried for whatever charge. Okay, It's an indictment. Now, to be removed from office, the impeached officer must be convicted by a two-thirds vote of the Senate. Okay, So the Senate will serve as the jury. They are the court, and they are presided over by the chief justice. The chief justice will serve as basically the judge of the court that will become the Senate, right? And he will hear the evidence, and, and, and he will make you know the rules and the decisions, etc. Here's where I have to correct your book. Please pay attention, okay? Your book says 19 persons have been impeached by the House, and eight have been convicted by the Senate. That is wrong. 20 people have been impeached by the House, and eight have been convicted. Um, I'm just trying to clear it up, okay? The last conviction was in 2010 when a federal judge was convicted and removed from office. It was a federal judge from Louisiana, if I remember correctly. Um, and he was removed for uh, some sort of corruption or false uh, false tax statement, you know, some sort of, of financial corruption. Okay, so 20 people have been impeached. Eight have been convicted. The last one to be convicted was in 2010, a federal judge. Your book says only two presidents. Ding, ding, ding. Three presidents have been impeached. Andrew Johnson in 1868, Bill Clinton in 1998, and I haven't added it, but Donald Trump in 2019. Okay. Richard Nixon would have been impeached in 1974, but he resigned before the House Judiciary Committee could recommend articles of impeachment because he knew his goose was cooked. The Senate did not convict Johnson or Clinton or Trump by the necessary two-thirds vote. Johnson's case was entirely political. If you would like to um, learn about an interesting bit of American history, look into the Andrew Johnson impeachment. It was purely political. Um, purely political. Basically, it all came back to radical Republicans who wanted to push a very hostile, punishing reconstruction on the South, were angry at Johnson, who was a little more soft and conciliatory. Um, their, their articles of impeachment were rather flimsy. And we're clearly politically motivated. Um, 
Now, I will say that in the case of Andrew Johnson, he came the closest to conviction of the three presidents who've been impeached. His vote was 35 to 19. He needed a 36 to 19 vote to be convicted. He was one vote shy of conviction. Um, I would like to point out at this time, three fourths of the United States Senate were Republicans. Um, you know, most of them radical Republicans who were more than willing to convict. Seven Republicans crossed the line and voted not guilty along with all the Democratic senators. And what's really interesting, in my opinion, if you look at that, the corruption, the bribery, the promises, what happened to those men who voted not guilty, how none of them ever served again in the House of, in, in the Congress, it's, it's interesting, okay? The case against Clinton, a little, a little more serious. Um, basically, it all went back to Clinton was charged with perjury because he lied under oath about his affair with Monica Lewinsky. He was also accused of obstruction of justice because he tried to block the um, the Kenneth Starr, who was the special prosecutor that was appointed to or independent counsel, excuse me, who was investigating on behalf of the um, House Judiciary Committee. Um, he was also accused of abuse of power because he apparently wrote false statements to the Judiciary Committee. Um, he actually was only impeached on two charges. He was impeached on perjury and obstruction of justice. Um, I think that they rolled. Um, they didn't even. They didn't. They didn't bother with the abuse of power charge. Uh, the vote for impeachment was well. Uh, was very partisan in the House. Um, basically, all the Republicans voted to impeach him, and like none of the Democrats did. The Senate vote was well short of conviction. If you're curious, on the charge of perjury, the vote was 45 to 55, not guilty. So 55 voted not guilty on perjury. The vote for obstruction of justice um, was a 50-50 down the down the middle split. Um, <clears throat> and I will go ahead and and give you the quick. Uh, Donald Trump was impeached on – actually, by the way, Johnson was impeached on 11 charges. They only voted on three of the charges, and when the vote on all three of the first three charges came up 35-19, they just said, okay, well, that's it. We're done because we know it's going to be like this for every single vote. Um, Donald Trump was impeached on two counts. He was impeached for abuse of power, and he was impeached for obstruction of justice. On the abuse of power charge, 48 to 52, not guilty. So 52 voted not guilty. And the charge of obstruction of Congress, 47 to 53, uh, again, 53 not guilty. Um, this vote was, again, along partisan lines with the glaring example or exception. Uh, Mitt Romney was the one extra guilty vote on the abuse of power. He was the only Republican that voted guilty on either one of the charges. Um, but again, none of those presidents have been convicted. Now, if you're curious, how did, how did Clinton survive? And I do like to go through the Clinton one a little bit more. First of all, a little more recent. I remember it. Um, secondly, it, it was a little more legit, so to speak. You know, again, the Johnson one was a purely political exercise. How did Clinton survive? Um, not, nobody was exactly thrilled at what he did. Right. Nobody was thrilled that the president was having an affair with the 21 year old or whatever intern, um, a married man with a child, you know, um, first family and all, you know, that this guy was was clearly having a, a affair while in the White House, no less, um, with this young woman, you know, temp worker, so to speak. Nobody was happy about that. But on the same token, we didn't want to impeach him for it. And the fact is, we weren't impeaching him for having an affair. We were impeaching him for lying about it. And a lot of Americans, I think, were like, yeah, of course he lied about it. Like, like he's going to tell the truth. It's not like he lied about, you know, this sounds terrible, and, and I'm, I sound like I'm justifying it. But from the stance of some members of Congress and the American public opinion, if you look at the polls, did what he did. Like, was it deserving of impeachment? A lot of Americans are like, no. I mean, it's embarrassing. It's horrible, but we shouldn't impeach him. Um, you know, right after Lewinsky revealed the sexual affair, his standings went up in the polls. Like, I'm not kidding. Here, let's go back real quick. Presidential popularity. There's the Lewinsky scandal. 
there there you go right there um yeah like he he had a bit of a bump there and it's not because we were like that way bill um i think a lot of people felt bad for his family they felt bad for his wife and his daughter um and just the way it was being handled you know the the republicans had their knives out man there was no mercy on this one and again people were like this isn't like nixon where he tried to use the cia to stop the fbi from doing something this guy lied about messing around with an intern you know um another factor the economy was strong the nation was at peace this guy balanced the budget he was a centrist a lot of americans like centrists you know eh, it's not the worst thing ever right um again i, I sound like i'm trying to justify it, but i'm trying to explain how i'm um, because he, he committed perjury it's not a question he clearly committed perjury he got away with it though because we were like yeah it's not so bad I will say that out of all of this, and your book noted, the death of the law that created the Office of the Independent Counsel. That was the one great victim. In 1978, Congress was upset by how the whole Watergate crisis had gone down. And they created a law that said that the Attorney General, okay, it said the Attorney General was to ask a three-judge panel to appoint independent counsel whenever high officials are charged with serious misconduct. Okay? Um, funny thing, in 1993, when that law expired, Clinton was the one who asked that we renew it. Eighteen people were investigated by various independent councils between 1978 and 1999. In about half of those cases, no charges were ever brought to court. Now, for a long time, Republicans disliked the law because the councils were consistently investigating them. Um, now, when Bill Clinton came to office, the councils started investigating him and his Democratic buddies, and so the Democrats turned against that law. When that law expired again in 1999, it was not removed. It was not renewed, um, and that has led us to this question, which came up very recently in our in our nation's history yet again: How will any high official? including the president, be properly investigated if the attorney general, who is responsible for investigations, is part of the president's cabinet. The attorney general is a presidential appointee, right? You get there because the president chose you, and the president has the right to fire you. How do you expect the attorney general of the United States to be a fair broker in investigating the president or the vice president, you know, or another member of the cabinet when that's their own team, right? That has been the question. Um, one answer is to let Congress do it, but you know, if the Congress is controlled by the president's party, uh, that doesn't really resolve the issue, now does it? And no one's come up with a good answer. Some founders thought or might have thought that impeachment would be used against presidents very frequently, um, but it's such a daunting task um, that it really will only be used for the gravest forms of misconduct, um, our most recent fiasco aside. Um, also, what is a high crime or a misdemeanor? Um, I mean, most scholars agree that it's got to be something illegal or unconstitutional, not just unpopular. That clearly to be impeached, you have to do something illegal. You can't just not be cool. Um, Again, that was the issue with Donald Trump, um, the, th the theory that he withheld funding to an ally that Congress had authorized. I don't want to get into all the minutia and detail. I'm just saying that was, that was the argument for those of you who are like, what, what did he do that was illegal? That's, that's one of the things that gets argued. Did he do something illegal? Because the money eventually got there. The question is, did he tie it up and was it? based on a quid pro quo, uh, whatever. Um, but we, we can all agree there has to be illegal activity to impeach a president. Um, now, President Ford pardoned Richard Nixon, um, which means Richard Nixon would never be prosecuted for the things he did while he was in office. Um, that has been one thing that we believe, that a president is not liable um, for prosecution. Um, it's not for certain. It's still one of those maybes, 
but no president has ever actually been tried for a criminal offense while president. And there's this general thought that a president can't be tried while they are president, that they first have to be removed from office or finish their term. Um, but regardless, now, <clears throat> for those people who are like, man, you've spent a lot of time on this. This is really not that big of a deal. The question of succession has occurred nine times in our country's history, right? Um, we've, had, we've had succession occur nine times, and we've had at least two times in our nation's history where we've had real disability in our president and the question of who's in charge, like who is running this show. Um, and so it, it is a real issue when you start to look at the number of presidents we've had and the fact that, again, nine times we've had that succession and twice we've had disability. Um, and it goes back to legitimacy, too. You know, one of the, one of the earliest challenges to America was a potential military coup which was stopped because George Washington would not take part in it. Um, you know, and Washington helped set the stage for a quiet, orderly presidential succession, right? When he said, I'm not going to run for a second term. And then there was that 1800 election, which if you remember your history, basically was a tie. And it, it was to be broken by a House of Representatives that was actually controlled by the opposite political party. It was a tie between two Republicans. But the Democratic Party controlled, not the Democratic, the Federalist Party controlled the House. And instead of just eh, naming one of their own to the presidency, they, they did choose Thomas Jefferson. And so legitimate, orderly passing of the baton is a big part of our, of, of our political tradition and political heritage that we need to maintain. And so to wrap it up, um, talking about the Office of the Presidency, and, and whatnot, just your book kind of gives a little a little quick summary. Um, <clears throat> here you go. All right. Presidents are like every other politician. Okay. They're just, a, they have a different nameplate and they have a different office. Okay. Um, but at the end of the day, presidents have to understand that they basically got three things they got to remember. The old move it or lose it, right? You've got limited time. You've got limited. You got a honeymoon period. You got popularity. Um, you know, you got the wind at your back. You better use it because you're going to lose it, right? It's going to go away no matter what you do. You, the clock is ticking. Don't get bogged down in details. Um, Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter's the greatest example. The devil's in the details. Um, Sometimes you got to take a Teddy Roosevelt approach. You got to throw out a big generic idea and just run with it, and we'll figure it out as we go, right? You can't sit there and cross every T and dot every I, um, and you can't solve every problem. Pick something, pick something, and run with it. Don't try and make America perfect. Just try and improve a couple things. And lastly, people get things done. Your cabinet, your secretaries, your advisors. They're only they're just a, a piece of the machine. You've got to find capable subordinates. Um, you got to get the right people in the right place. And if I could throw out a little, you know, uh, assessment of our current situation, I think that's our that is probably Donald Trump's problem right now. In my in my humble opinion, amongst other things, he doesn't have good subordinates for one reason or another. Um, in general, just judging from some of the things that, that have occurred the last couple of years. I don't know if he's got all the right people in the right spots, um, but that's what you need. You need you need good players, right, to use a metaphor. As a coach, you can have a great game plan. If you have horrible players, you're not going to win, right? you got to have the right people in the right place at the right time. So hopefully you all have a better grasp of the presidency and some of the various details regarding it. If not, feel free to email me any questions.